Okay, guys, this is one of our sections on interpersonal violence. Um, this is the one specifically about murder. So the definition of interpersonal violence is violence that occurs between people acting outside of any role or agency or representation of an organization. So murder, specifically, is the intentional and unlawful killing of a person or persons. Homicide is just the killing of another person, whether it be unintentional. Um, the legal murder definition excludes um, what is considered to be justifiable homicide, whether it's committed in the act of duty, as in if you were a cop or a soldier, or in the case of self-defense by a private citizen. Um, or if you live in an area that has stand your ground or something like that. Um, and then manslaughter and suicide. Um, <clears throat> regardless of the legal definitions, these would all be acts of homicide. But in some cases, they would be institutional violence and not interpersonal. So if it were a soldier acting in the role of the military, or if it was a police officer acting in the role of a police officer, um, those would be institutional violence, not interpersonal violence. If it were a private citizen versus another private citizen, it is always going to be considered interpersonal violence. So these kind of things create some problems with government data, which is based on data for justification and intent. So um, I don't think they really track the number of people killed by police. Um, the media has been doing a better job of that lately, but statistically, um, the government doesn't track the number of people killed um, by police officers. Um, but they do track the number of murders within cities and stuff. So um, the data is a little skewed. Um, recent trends. Um, there's Unfortunately, the data only comes out every couple of years, and then it's actually released for the year before. Um, so sometimes all of the data that we get is not as up-to-date as we'd like to, to get, um, especially if you don't have a um, subscription to one of these places where they give you like the most up-to-date stuff. Um, but generally, there's been a downward trend since the early 90s. It leveled off in the first half of 2000, um, but then it's been continuing to go down. Um, the lowest rate for homicides in the U.S. was 2014, and that was the lowest we've seen in almost 50 years. So despite what some news outlets may say or some newspapers or whatever, um, murder is not going up and it's not getting out of control. It may be more focused in certain areas, but overall, statistically, across the United States, it's going down quite a bit. Um, violent crime in 19th century America indicates a stable or declining trend. Um, there was a shift upward shortly before the Civil War that stayed until the 1870s. Um, after the Civil War, there was a dramatic increase in violent crime. We'll talk about that. It's called the war effect. Um, but it declined during the Great Depression in the 30s and until the 60s, and then it began to go up again. Um, and then the decline that we're seeing now has been going on since the 90s. So it's been kind of a little bit of an up and down roller coaster, but... 
Um, as I was saying, the wartime effect, this is um, an idea found by Archer and Gartner that most combatant nations compared to non-combatant nations experienced substantial post-war increases in homicide. And the homicide rates went up in both nations despite whether they won or lost. Um, if they were involved in any sort of conflict and combat situation, the rates of homicide in that nation went up after the war, even after the fighting was over. Um, whether the economy went up or whether the economy went down with both men and women and cross age groups. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, um, idea, you know, why is, is violence legitimized by, you know, wartime activities? Is it, you know, the exposure of wartime activities? Is it the anxiety that comes with wartime activities? Like how does this, you know, um, and then what about the drug war? The drug war is something that we've been having for a really long time. Um, does that make a difference? Um, food for thought. Um, so for murder, there's definitely gender patterns. Um, males, sorry guys, you're more than nine times more likely to commit murder than women are. Um, and most homicide victims are men also, uh, almost 80%. So men are more likely to commit murder and be the victims of murder. However, if you are a woman, almost 90% of the time, it was a guy that did it. So regardless of who the victim is, the guys, a guy is the one that did it. Um, whether the victim is a male or a female. So males are more likely to be victims of murder. Um, when the relationship between the victim and the offender is more distant. So if these are complete strangers, um, you know, if this is like a robbery where somebody dies or it's a bar fight and somebody dies, um, if it's more of a, you know, they're not really friends, they're not intimates or anything like that, um, men are more likely to be the victims. If the victim or if the relationship is close and considered quote unquote intimate, um, whether you're dating or friends with benefits or however you want to define it, um, women are more likely to be the victim when it's considered a close relationship. So of all the female murder victims, the proportion killed by an intimate partner has been relatively stable between 76 and 99. Um, again, not all the data that we get is, I can guarantee you this hasn't changed. Um, while, you know, male murder victims, the proportion, uh, the proportion killed by an intimate has been dropping. So, um, males kill males more than 10 times more than women kill women. Um, even though men are more likely to be the victims of murder, it's important to note that the rate of death by homicide and legal intervention, either death by police or something like that, um, for women doubled between, um, 50 and 89. And then since then, the rates for both male and female have generally declined. So, um, still the general trend has been homicides are going down. Um, there's also age patterns. Um, so if we look back, let's remember that the gender pattern is that men are more likely to be perpetrators and victims. 
If a woman is the victim, though, most of the time, the perpetrator is a man, especially if they are in an intimate relationship. Okay, so age patterns. What are we looking at here? Um, people age 18 to 34... 64% of murder offenders. So they're only about a quarter of the population, but they're killing way more people than any of the other age groups. Um, they're very overrepresented in the rate of offending than um, especially those between 20 and 24. They are only 7% of the population, but they're doing a quarter of the homicides. So after the 20 to 24 age group, the next highest is between 17 and 19 and then 25 and 29. So it's um, kind of a drinking age. Um phase, I guess, between 20 and 24, um, you're probably in college, you're, you know, drinking, you have freedom, you're doing whatever, um, socially, um, you are more likely to be a murderer as well. So, um, that is the gist of the age pattern, um, as far as victimization, it's right along the same lines as if you are a murderer. Um, homicide is the second leading cause of death for people between 10 and 24. Um, specifically between 18 and 24. So this goes right along with this age group are all hanging out together. You're more likely to be the victim and you're more likely to be the perpetrator. In general, the, the offender is usually younger than the victim. For example, um, the difference is about four years, according to the um, Bureau of Justice Statistics. Not always the case. Um, but there is usually a little bit of difference. Um, the greatest disparity in age between the victim and the offender was in the case of um, felony murder between strangers like robbery and murder, where the um, average age of the victim was 40 and the average age of the offender was 26. So generally speaking, though, if you're going to go out and kill somebody, odds are you're between 20 and 24. And so is the victim of that crime. Um, the declining age of victimization is a pattern found in developing capitalist societies like ours. Um, in earlier stages of capitalist development and pre-capitalist societies, the peak ages of victimization for murder was higher. In all acts of interpersonal violence, those who are in the most marginal positions of the society has the highest rates of involvement. So as youth become more displaced and marginalized, you know, they're... Um, this is the age bracket where they should be getting out, moving into their own homes. They should be starting college. They should be doing all of these other things. Um, right now they have a really high unemployment rate. There's a lot of kids that aren't moving out. They're choosing to stay home with their parents because they can't afford to leave. Um, they are, they are displaced. They are being marginalized economically. And that is why we're seeing such a high rate of murder within that age group. Despite, you know, just the, oh, they're young and they're having fun. I mean, that's not, things get out of hand. That's not really, that, that may be a portion of it. But this is a trend that they see outside of the U.S. as well. The, this is a group of people that are being marginalized economically and 
are following predicted patterns of violence as a result. And not just homicide, I mean, or interpersonal violence. They're also, I mean, any kind of crime and delinquency is where we see this kind of stuff. So, but since we're talking about homicide, we're going to focus on that. Um, so we know so far, recap, let's make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, men, more likely to be offenders and victims, unless the victim is a female, still a man that's doing it. 18 to 24 is the dominant age group for victims, 20 to 24 for offenders. So there's a little bit of an overlap there. <coughs> Excuse me. What about ethnicity? Um, the overall pattern is that ethnic minority populations are overrepresented as offenders, just like the, um, the age group that we talked about earlier being very overrepresented. Um, the same is done for the same is the case for minorities. Um, murder, just like rape and assault is generally an intra-racial crime, which means white on white, black on black, Hispanic on Hispanic. You know, this is, you're more likely to stay within your own ethnic uh, group if you're going to kill somebody. Um, the leading cause of death for African American males between 15 and 34 is homicide. In 1999, African Americans were six times more likely to be murdered than whites. And here's some nice little disturbing charts that you can look at. Um, social class. Lower income categories have the highest rate of offending and victimization. This goes back to who is economically marginalized. These are... 20 to 24 year old people, blacks especially, that are in this lower income bracket that are socially marginalized. That's why we're seeing such high rates with these groups. It's not just a coincidence. This is a reflection of the way that the stratification is set up. Um, murder is a crime mostly of lower income categories. Rates of offending and victimization decline with income. So the more money you make, the less like you, likely you are to be murdered. Um, so the victim and offender relationship. Um, most homicides are generally between people who at least know each other. Um, you are coworkers or you know somebody from a local hangout or, you know, they're your barista at Starbucks. Um, you're more likely to be killed by somebody that you know than some just random dude that just walks up to you on the street. Um, overall, the rate by which you are likely to be murdered by someone you know is four times greater than if it, than being killed by a stranger. Uh, in general, about one third of female murder victims were killed by someone considered to be intimate, whereas only 4% of male murder victims were killed by an intimate. So alcohol and weapons, um, where do these play a role? Um, alcohol is a catalytic factor of all the drugs that are either outlawed or regulated, alcohol has the strongest and greatest link to, vi or link to violence. Um, weapon availability is a factor that distingu distinguishes assault from homicide. So if you have a gun in the home, that's potentially the only difference between beating the crap out of someone and murdering someone. 
the region of the country with the highest level of firearm ownership is such as the South also has the highest murder rate. This goes right up to the above point where if you have a weapon available, you're more likely to use it. Whether you're a responsible owner or not, um, the more barriers you can put between yourself and that weapon when you're just ticked off or whatever um, could mean whether or not you're going to prison. <laughs> Um, Hoskins found that homicide rates are consistently higher in countries that have a greater supply of firearms in private hands. And according to Gallup polls, one out of every three people in the United States owns a gun. And a lot of people own more than one. You can look at this nice little chart here, and it shows the gun availability based on some different data, um, whether it be age. Um, if you look at the, the categories based on what we know so far about homicide, men are more likely to own a gun. Ages 18 to 29, they don't own the gun all of the time, but they have one of the higher rates of access when you look at someone in their home owning one also. Um, even though whites have more guns, blacks are overrepresented or overrepresented within that group. Um, some college. So if you have some college, you're more likely to own a gun. This is that uh, 18 to 24 year old group. Uh oh. Um, the South, as we said earlier, rural people are more likely to own guns. Um, not necessarily. Um, any statistics on whether or not you live somewhere, but if you think of rural populations, rural populations tend to be lower socioeconomic status. So those are also the people that are more likely to be involved in a homicide, either as the victim or the offender. So you can kind of see some overlap there. Okay, so inequality, you know, does inequality increase the likelihood of violence? Um, both poverty and equality have been found to be related to homicide. Um, as we said earlier, it's this di these displaced groups socioeconomically that don't have access to the resources. These are the people that are more likely to be the victims and the perpetrators in homicides. Um, uh, Kron et al. in their study of income inequality and homicide find that income inequality has a moderate effect on levels of homicide. Um, the effect of income inequality on homicide rates is strongest in wealthier countries and countries with larger law enforcement systems. So these are places where there's an abundance of stuff. People are general. There's a lot of wealthy people, but there's also a lot of inequality and there's a lot of law enforcement to enforce and regulate, um, these systems. Um, cultural differences within societies um, also can potentially magnify the effects of inequality. Um, they found that the relationship between ethnic heterogeneity eh, in homicide rates in his 36 countries in his sample. So um, 
and hetero, that means between different races. Um, again, you don't need to know all the statistics or the different um, findings and studies and stuff. Um, so what does the anthropological literature tell us? Um, patterns of homicide as they stem from male control over women are found in other societies, even without classes. Um, so as property relations become more developed, homicide stems from not only controlling women, but also in disputes over property. So there is the gender inequality issue and then the access to resources, even in places that don't have social classes. This is access to resources that goes right along with the haves and the have nots. Um, so what about motives um, and inequality? Generally speaking, when we look at patterns of homicide in lesser developed or developed countries, um, we find that um, the focus on disputes over sexual access or privilege. Um, this is men controlling women um, and disputes over access to property and disputes over access to power and status. These um, precipitate conflict. So does violence have an effect on inequality? Does it make it worse? Um, if members of a particular group are more likely to be victims of homicide than members of another group, um, which is in the case of the United States where um, younger um, African Americans are more likely to be in here. Um, this creates a disadvantage in terms of power and access and control. Um, you know, what about the poor? What about ethnic minorities? What about women? Um, their risk of victimization does that create disadvantages um, in life in general? Does it impact the opportunities to live a more complete and fulfilling life? If you have to worry about being the victim because of your position in the hierarchy, do you have a disadvantage? So if you are you know, upper class white male, if you can please, you know, move yourself to another seat at the table and look around from one of these other positions, do you feel that they have a disadvantage? Um, people in these other seats at the table, what, how do you feel as far as, you know, do you feel that you're disadvantaged compared to someone else? Um, that is all we have for this section. Um, again, make sure you know the dominant patterns for each of these groups. Make sure you know how they're in interconnected to the hierarchy. And think about what types of ideology may be at play in justifying um, that these patterns are okay. Um, if you have questions, feel free to post them on the discussion board on Blackboard. Um, and the next section is going to be interpersonal violence, rape.